It's a great day today, and uh, isn't it good to know that in the world you will have tribulation, but be of because Jesus said, I've overcome the world. So really what that's all about is it's not about the actual thing taking place. It's, it's about a perspective. It's about how we set our, our, our minds. It's, it's how we go to bed at night and how we get up in the morning. Again, you've heard this said before, but you don't get up and begin your day trying to work for victory in things. You get up working from a place of victory. In other words, the victory is already won through Christ. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. I mean, we don't have to go back and, and try to figure out how this thing is going to work out. It's already worked. It's already done. It's already finished. All we've got to do is plug into the source that has already finished and completed all things. Then we watch and see how that manifests and how it works out in our lives. Um, in this, in this uh, series, it's just a short series uh, next, uh, through next week, and I, I, my, my whole idea, and, and Tiffany, uh, my daughter and I came up with this idea, uh, I, I wish the guy was a little bit more lean, but nevertheless, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the only one we could find, uh, but anyhow, I should have had, I should have had some of our, our, you know, our chipped clean, you know, guys get up there and pose for this, but the whole idea was this, is it's guys sitting on a bench, and out in front of him really is the world. It's his world. And, and the whole idea really of this and my thought process as I, as I prayed about this, you know, uh, weeks ago, months ago, or actually, is, is that I wanted, I wanted people just to, from a visual to get an idea of this is, where, this is where oftentimes the body of Christ is. We're sitting and we're, we're watching and we're seeing a world that is waiting on us to arrive. But as long as we're complacent and as long as we're casual, as long as we're focused on us, as long as we're comfortable, as long as we're living in fear, as long as we're living in entitlement, whatever that bench name is for you, as long as you're living in pride, as long as you're living in self, you know, loathing, no, low self-esteem. What keeps you from moving and activating and releasing the very thing that that world is waiting on you to come and to deliver to them? Because every single one of us in here have a purpose and have an intent that God has for us from the very foundations of the world. So last week, I, I kind of took a different spin on this. It wasn't just about getting up. And really, this is about serving because Jesus came you know, not to be served, but to serve and, and to give his life as a ransom for all men. And he did that. And the example that he established and what he set in his three and a half years of ministry and how he, how he worked through situations, how every encounter that he had, whether somebody was coming against him with judgment and persecution or whether somebody was coming to him with a need and crying out for help. In every aspect, Jesus always worked from the foundation of serving, of releasing. It was always moving out. It was never him asking for them to give in to him. It was always him pouring out. And in his pouring out, man, he was filled. He, he had compassion for the masses. He, he loved the world that he was sent. I mean, he willingly, he willingly left his deity, that part of the God, the word. He was the word in heaven. But when he got to earth, he became the son known as Jesus. Fact is, is there were a lot of little boys named Jesus in, in uh, Palestine in that day. The thing is, but there was only one Jesus, the Christ. The anointed one in his anointing is what Christ means and stands for. Remember, the Bible said back in Isaiah that, that Mary bore the child, but God gave the son. And, and the thing is, is that the whole aspect of, of trying to wrap our minds around the fact that Jesus was all man, yet he was all God. He experienced everything that you and I would experience, not maybe in detail and in, in, in originality, but in category. And I, I think I talked about that in the last series that I, that, that I had shared with you. Uh, I can't remember the name of the previous series I did, but me versus me. And I, I, I told you the whole, the whole thing that there's three things, three categories of life. In other words, John said that this, this is, this is the, the world. This is, this is what is always going to dictate and always, you're always going to be battling with. It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those three categories. 
So, so how we are tempted in those areas and how we battle those three areas is going to look different for you than it may be for me. But the fact is, is that Jesus was tempted in all points like as we, but he still remained without sin, and he still remained on his mission of serving and coming to be love in this world. So he says, as the Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. So you ever get confused at what you're supposed to be doing? You know, what's my purpose on this earth? We're all looking for the purpose. Why are we here? You know, why were we born at this time? Why did our parents have us at this, in this season? You know, why couldn't I be born into a rich family? Why couldn't I be born? You know, and we ask all these questions. You know, I never ask that. But the fact is, is some people, some people wish, you know, what, oh, what if I, you know, would have, could, and should, and it would have been nice, and oh, but. And we go all through these kinds of things. But why, why is it right now? What, what, am I just supposed to get up and punch a clock? Am I just supposed to own a business and, and try to just make it through and be the best? Am I, am I supposed to get up and, and, and just go to school and, and get an education and not really sure what I want to do or if I'm even going to apply anything I'm learning in school? Sometimes I, there's stuff in school I learned I don't, even, I don't have any use for it right now, quite frankly. You know, maybe I'm not smart. Maybe I'm actually still dumb. I don't know. But the fact is, is that I, I just, I understand that there are things that we go through and we try to determine, is this the way? Is this why I'm here? What am I supposed to be doing? Here's the thing. You are called to be Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who would ever believe on, whoever would believe on him would not perish but have everlasting life. You as a believer have been already given that. It's done. It's finished. Now, that is what the everlasting part is to come. That's, that's someday. We don't know when that someday is, when that ends for us on this earth. But we are, Jesus said, we are to occupy until he comes. We're not to sit on a bench and wait for the world to come to us and hope that things change so that I can then get up and I'll have everything I need. The fact is, is everything you need is already finished and completed, but you have got to put something in motion in order to activate it and to engage. So here's the thing. Last week I told you, uh, we shared a, a scripture out of Colossians, third chapter, Colossians 3.22. Let's put that up there. Let me read it to you. I just wanted to refresh your memory. It said, uh, bonds, um, here we go, bond servants obey in all things, masters according to the flesh. That's not, the, that's not it. That's not Colossians 3, 22 and through 23. Let me read it to you. Okay, Colossians 3, 22. It says this, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of, of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. So remember, whatever you do, this is really the picture of Jesus, do it heartily. Do it with everything that you have. Lay it out. Lay it on the field. Because you're not doing it to men. You're doing it as unto the Lord. But while you're doing it, understand and know that from the Lord, you will receive the reward of the inheritance. That's not someday when we get in glory. The inheritance isn't going to do us any good over there. The inheritance is going to do us something right here. There are seasons of release of inheritance that have been designed to come to you as you grow and as you come to maturity for them to be released. Now, let's go to Galatians, the fourth chapter, and let me read something there. Do we have that up there? Galatians 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, remember an heir is uh, inheritance, is somebody who has an inheritance coming. The heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ, catch this, at all from a slave. Whoa, though he's master of all. He's got it all. His name is on it. But he's no different as a child than a slave. What, what is a slave? Really, in general, a slave is a servant. A slave is one who serves the needs or the intents or the desires of, of a master. The child is, you could say, the child doesn't differ than a, anything from a servant, though he is master of all. Now go to verse 2. But is under guardians and stewards until the, the time 
appointed by the Father. I was thinking about some things this week. Uh, <clears throat> had a lot of activity going on and, and uh, just, man, I just, you know, the, th the things that happen in the body of Christ, there's that, just, just ignore that, okay? Uh, and I have, have that mic ready in case I need it here. If it does it again, we'll, we'll shift and change. But uh, the thing is this, is, is I was thinking a variety of things. Uh, the stuff happening with Jeff, uh, our, our son-in-law, turn it off, uh, came, came out of nowhere, came out of nowhere, unusual. And, uh, you know, now they say, you know, they say now somebody's going to have to deal with all of his life. And he's going you know, to have treatments. You know, that's what they say. They, they, treatments every single week. You know, for the rest of his day, he has to go in, and it's and it, so that that's the doctor's report. We get that, and then and then Suzanne, uh, I man, I, man, we have been standing and agreeing for her father. Uh, it just came out of nowhere, you know, and and uh, he's he's been in the hospital now for I guess it's about a month and a half, uh, or two months, two months, and uh, we were praying for us in, in staff and declaring he wasn't he was out here not long ago. Um, and, and visited, and, and man, had a great time, and, and we were praying, and, and actually, uh, actually on Friday morning, she, she said, you know, just pray, because, you know, he, my dad had a, had a heart attack, and, and just pray that he comes forth, and that he walks out of that hospital, and man, we, that's what we've been believing for, and I, man, we, I responded back, said, we are standing, we see him walking, walking whole, and walking free, and it was about 45 minutes later, she said, my dad's with Jesus, and so you, you sit there and you try to, try to go back and forth and understand why. And, and, and so all these things happen. And one thing that, that I think really comes to mind in, in seasons like this, and I, and I know Pastor Mike was out in, in Nashville uh, doing a memorial service, celebration of life for a dear friend of his who, who just passed away. And, and, uh, and you, 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 start, you start dealing with all these things and you start looking around and saying, all right, what's happening well, what's the deal here? And you, you start reassessing a few things, and you start looking around and saying, what, what, is, what is my purpose? What is the worth? What is my intent? Am, am, I, am I focused on the wrong stuff? Am I spending my day getting up always tied in to things that really, in the end, aren't going to have any impact on eternity whatsoever? Because, because our, man, our purpose is not limited to what we see around us. It's, it's limited to things that are far greater and higher. Man, the purpose and the work of, of Christ was, was far greater than anything that you can envision. And what you think is great here it hasn't even touched the scratch of the scratch of the surface of what God has desired and purposed for this earth and for humanity and for the body of Christ, the church. But I got to thinking about things. And one thing I realized in looking back and, you know, what, what, is, what makes people happy? What brings joy in, a, in, in people's lives? And I, I have, in, uh, thus far in my life, I've met a, a lot of people from multiple ethnicities and cultures and, you know, from every economic level and, and every, you know, every different scale of, uh, of life. And, and one thing that I have discovered is this, is that the people, the people the most fulfilled and joyful are the people who are givers. They're just givers. And, and the fact is, is I've been, around, I've been around some people who have accumulated much in the natural realm. In material things. They've accumulated a lot. And frankly, a lot of them most of the time are miserable. And they're miserable to be around. <laughs> If we would just trust the words of Jesus, because he knows the secrets to true joy and fulfillment. The people who are most fulfilled in life are the people that live a life of servitude. Now, that word servitude, I'm not talking about somebody who does acts of service. That's a good thing. But more, I'm talking about a person who has an attitude of giving that permeates every phase and area of their life. It's the people who say, who say this, God, everything that I have is not my own, but it's, it's for your purposes to use however you want to use it. It's people who say that however and whenever you want to use me, I commit my life to a life of servitude unto you. I have submitted my life. I've submitted my talents. I've submitted my anointing. I've submitted my abilities and, and my giftings to you. I mean, it came from him anyhow. And frankly, church, that's, that's the channel of blessing 
That's how it flows. I mean, the, the Bible says that, that promotion comes from above. It doesn't say it comes from God. It says it comes from above. See, you can't be promoted if you refuse to follow instruction. As a matter of fact, promotion, promotion can only come from someone's instruction that you're willing to follow. Because promotion is from above. God has order. God is the ultimate above. I mean, James says that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there's no shadow of turning. We know that he's the, every, God is above everything. But God has order and he has processes and he has alignments. Let me just dig a little bit deeper. Go back and put Galatians 4.1 uh, back up there again. Galatians 4.1, it says, it says that now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. Now, let me dig into that just a little bit here. Because the thing is, is that, is that last week we talked about the fact that, that inheritance isn't harvest. Harvest is depending on something that you do. It's an act that you take. It's something that you sow that you then reap a result, a harvest from. That's not inheritance. Harvest is based on what you do. Inheritance is based on your identity and your position. So remember that an inheritance is a prearranged blessing designed to be released at a specific time of maturity. Now, maturity can come in a variety of ways. It can be age uh, you know, related in some situations, but even more often it is character or growth or development related. And the thing is this is that, that the heir, as long as he is locked in that realm of immaturity or child, uh, childness, that he does not qualify for the inheritance. So let's look at that. So technically, I... I could be master of a great inheritance, and it's got my name on it, yet I have not grown up enough for it to be released to me. That is where much or a lot of the church is, is that God has, has established and set up an inheritance for everybody here with your name on it. I don't know what it looks like because it'll be different for you than it will for me. But I do know this, if it came from a father like God, it's going to be real, it's going to be big, it's going to be great, it's going to be powerful, because that's who he is. But then go on to verse 2. And verse 2 again says, but is under guardians and stewards. Now stop there. Under. Who's under? The heir. The child. Is under. Under. <laughs> we live in a generation today that brags that they aren't under nobody. And they wear it like a badge. And I, my mom ain't going to tell me what to do. Well, my mom sure did. <laughs> yeah, you should have come to my house. And, and if I chose not to do it initially, when I came to, I eventually ended up doing exactly, exactly what she said. You know? <laughs> So the thing is this, the thing is this, is that we have a generation that says, I'm not going to listen to my dad. I'm not going to listen to my teacher. I'm not going to listen to any authority. Can I tell you something? There are two ways that wisdom flow. You need to tweet this one out or put it on, post it. Two ways that wisdom flow. Wisdom flows through a mentor or it flows through experience. And at my age, let me tell you clearly that a mentor which is a trusted individual who has your best interest at heart and advises and, and, and teaches and counsels and encourages you because they, they, they believe the best in you. That is the best and quickest route to go. Trust me. But if you choose to go ahead and to walk through life with the attitude that nobody's going to tell me what to do, let me tell you what you've done. You have relegated God to teach and to train you primarily through failure. So what that means is that you are going to have to screw up big time in order for God to teach you anything. 
And that means you're going to spend much of your life and your time and, and your energy cleaning up your own mess just to learn a lesson that if you had listened to one voice that you trusted who could have showed you that, hey, here's where the landmines are. Here's the best path to take. Man, here's where you should keep your focus. See, so, so God puts us under guardians, and he puts us under stewards until the appointed time. So in other words, you, you, if you don't submit yourself and come under, you're not going to qualify for your inheritance. When I was a teenager, I came to a conclusion one day. I think I was about 16, 17 years old. I came to the conclusion that my parents were not all that intelligent. And... And I, I established that from a variety of things because I knew everything at that point in time. And, and when I got into my 20s and, and got married, there were a couple things that came back to my mind. They said that, I thought, yeah, that makes sense. And then I got into my 30s and, you know, had a kid. And, and I realized that, you know what, a few other things they said made a lot of sense. <laughs> I got into my 40s and 50s and I woke up one day and said, dang, my parents were absolute geniuses, man. And I... And I, I need to learn from that somehow. But, but the thing is this, is, is experience is a wonderful teacher. But hear me, it doesn't mean that it's always got to be your experience. Why would you have to go through something that somebody else already went through and could show you what not to do or what to do? See, so he puts us under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. You know, they're submitting your life to instruction and to the voices of wisdom. In other words, you're, you come under, under. There's a, uh, a story in the, uh, in the New Testament. It's actually recorded in three of the four Gospels. It's about a Roman centurion. And this guy's a pagan, obviously. He's, you got to remember, Jesus came up uh, during the Roman Empire. The Hebrews disliked the Romans greatly, and they, they wanted to believe that Jesus was a king that would come and help them overthrow that empire. But they didn't understand his kingdom. They, they, didn't, they didn't realize that his kingdom was within you. But, but we, we look and we've probably read, if you've been in church for any period of time, you, you might have heard a little bit of this story. Let me just go to Matthew 8. Put that up there. and Let, let, me, let me just read that to you. It said, now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, well, I will come and I'll heal him. Then the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should even come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another one, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and, and he does it. Now, let me, just, let me just recap this thing a little bit. So what's happening here is this Roman centurion, obviously his post is... is, is established somewhere where Jesus and all the activity of Jesus is taking place, at least from time to time. Now, I don't know, I don't know if the Roman centurion, some of them kind of would, would their, their responsibility was to kind of go with the crowd to make sure that nothing broke out that would, you know, get out of hand. But he's watching Jesus. And he, when you read through Matthew 8 and you read through the other gospels, I mean, Jesus is, is doing Jesus stuff. I mean, he's healing people. He's healed the leper. He's healed uh, Peter's mother-in-law. You know, he's healed the woman with the issue of blood. And, and so this Roman centurion is watching all of this. And I don't know how long he's been watching, but one day he comes and he says, Lord, he said, my servant is paralyzed and he's, he's messed up. And Jesus said, okay, just hold on here and I'll come to your house. And he said, oh, no, 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 you don't need to come. See, I've been watching this thing. I see how it all works. If you just say the word, because I've been watching you. When you speak, stuff happens. Man, when you declare a word, man, the, the, the atmosphere shifts and changes. Nothing never stays the same. He said, if you speak the word, my servant will be healed. And then the next words are some of the most odd words, really, when you think about it. Because he said, for I 
also. So he is, he is connecting and comparing with Jesus. I also am a man not in authority or a man that has authority. I'm a man under authority. So he has already established something that if Jesus, the way he operates, if he would just still continue to operate that way, say a word because he is under authority, then the authority of the word will break forth. In other words, this Roman centurion, whenever he spoke, things moved as well. He said, go and they go and come and they come and, and do this and, and they do that. Well, not because he was a man who had authority, because he was a man who was under authority. You only have authority that you are under. See, if I, I can't walk into Intel plant in Chandler here. Some of you work there. And thousands of employees. I can't walk in there and start barking orders and instructions because I'm not under their authority system. I, I can't go into a Walmart store and start telling all the little people in there, you know, go do this, do that, because I'm not under their authority. But if I was in their system and, and under their authority, then I could go to them, which I have authority, and I could say, come, and they come and go, and, and, and they would go. See, many of you have, have heard that, that there's power in the name of Jesus. But when you say the name, you don't ever see anything happen. Do you know why? It's because you can't use a name that you're not under. Now listen to me. If you come under the name, then when you speak the name, there will be power attached to it. So, so you, you, you realize you can't, you can't just go live any old crazy way you want to. You can't just go off and live in, unto yourself and unto your pleasures. And then all of a sudden you get serious because you hit a rough patch in, in your life and you say, well, in the name of Jesus. No, it's you submitting to that name. It's you bringing your life under that name so that then when you speak the name, that fevers break and tumors shrink and addictions are broken. You don't have it until you come under it. I hope you're feeling me here. Okay, just a little bit. Man, we, we go slinging the name of Jesus around all over the place, and we haven't, we haven't even acknowledged the authority. We haven't, we haven't even submitted to his lordship. But somehow we think that we pray to prayer somewhere. We got a ticket to heaven. And now that we can just start pulling here and there and just making it work for us. So then we have a body of believers that are weak and malnutritioned. They're hurting. They think they're doing the right thing because somebody said in the name of Jesus, but they're not submitted to the name. Put up 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians 13. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never fails. Nowhere in that definition of love does it talk about take. It's always outward. It's always outward focused. Those are the happiest and most fulfilled people. <clears throat> Come on back, Sam. I think I think I feel like I need to start going somewhere with this. 
there will be people that will take your love and absolutely drain you dry if you let them. Those people are probably very miserable as well. So Paul says that, that love serves. Everything about love is, is going out. It's releasing. It's, it's sowing. Love says, listen, I believe in you. Even though you messed up, <laughs> come on. I know that's not the real you because I'm going to bear all things and I'm going to hope all things and I'm going to endure along with you. And I'm going to believe the next time it's not going to happen like it happened this last time. Now, I'm not going to stop giving you truth. I'm not going to, stand, I'm not going to stop standing firm on the word. I'm not going to be shaken. But I believe in you. Love is patient. And, and love is kind. See, love serves Love is always, always giving. But then in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 13, put that up there. This verse Paul throws in here, and it almost seems like it, it, it just does not fit the whole flow of, of what he's been talking about, where he's going. So he comes, and kind of out of nowhere, he says, when I was a child... A child. Remember we talked in Galatians that the heir is when he's a child? But he said, when I was a child. Now, remember, with God, maturity is not defined in calendar years. I mean, there's, there's people older than I am that I wouldn't trust with a pair of scissors. I mean, <laughs> and there are 16-year-olds who could run a successful business. You see, so... So God doesn't define maturity in calendar years. So, so how does he define it? Because my inheritance is, is not released until I grow up. So he puts me under voices, or at least makes them available to me, that could help me grow up if I heed the voices. So he says, when I was a child, I talked just like a little kid. I, I understood just the way kids understand things. You know, I, I thought as a child, most time, children, you know this. This is why parents have to teach. Everything is pretty much self. It's a, what about me? Eh, I want. No, no. Yeah, yeah. And they go, and that's a child. But he said, when I became a man, I put away that way of speaking and that way of understanding and perceiving and that way of thinking. So maturity or the lack thereof is always based on three things. It's based on how a person thinks, how a person understands. That means that's talking about perception how you perceive, which then, then dictates how you reason and also then how you speak. You show me somebody that their tongue is always flapping the issue and the problem and the frustrations and the mountain and complaining and the judgment, and I'll show you somebody that their inheritance is a long way off if it ever comes. But in order for it to be released, they have got to bring that tongue into alignment with truth. In other words, they've got to bring it under the Word of God, which is truth. Then you, you have to know how to think. Man, I've, I've talked with 40 and 50-year-old men who still think like kids. And man, I just want to say, grow up. Grow up. And then it says that you have to understand or you've got to perceive properly. There are people that, that tend to perceive things as though they're always the victim. That it's always their problem. It's always somebody else's fault. And if it wasn't for that, and people have tried to tell you that, you know what, you might need to look at this in your own life, and you keep reverting back to pointing your fingers. Listen, if 20 people in a row tell you that there's something wrong with you, there just might be something 
wrong with you? I want to be honest with you. I think that you, without Walls Church, here, online family, you are part of mine and Dina's inheritance. Maybe we're part of your inheritance. And, and, and you say, Pastor, well, what, what does that even look like? I mean, explain that. Well, I, I, I don't know in totality, but I'll tell you what. I, I think it's... I think it's people. I think it's financial. I think it's quality of life. I think it's opportunities and platforms. I think that it's impact and influence. See, I'm convinced that it is far, far bigger than we can even think. But I will tell you this, the serving is the way to get there. Serving. Just following instructions. Do you know that for some people it's the hardest thing just to follow an instruction? And we've never tied these things that I've talked about to inheritance or to a great blessing. So in other words, then when we get up here and from week to week or month to month, we we give you opportunities to, to be able to insert yourself into the, the life and the mission of this church to be a move and an impact in, a, in our community and in our world. It's, that's not a volunteer drive. That's not a volunteer plea. Oh, come, please help us. We need you. Yeah, we need you. We want you. He needs you. He wants you. That's not what it is. When we give those opportunities, that is you beginning to qualify for your inheritance. What is it that you've been believing for? What is it that you've been praying for? What is it that you have been expecting and anticipating? Have you been doing it from your bench? Have you been waiting for God to move so then that you can get up and move? Are you waiting for somebody to come along and, and, and help you up and say, okay, come on, follow me. This is, the, this is how we're going to do this. Where are you? Colossians 3, whatever, whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. If you're going to do something, you can't do it there. Do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance. Get off the bench. Make the decision. Put feet to your prayers. Set yourself in motion. Give God something to work with and watch Watch your future unveil before you with purpose, with might. Will you stand to your feet? Let's give God praise in the house. Come on. Come on. Just lift up a shout of praise. You can clap again. Come on. Just thank him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I want every head bowed and every eyes closed. Just, just, and the reason I ask that is just to shut out everything here just for a moment. I don't know if in the communication this morning I got anything across or felt like, felt like I was just trying to be honorable to the Holy Spirit this morning because it's all about Him and what He wants anyway. But I don't know, for those of you who are believers in the faith, you have made a decision and you, you call yourself a Christian. I, I, don't, I don't know where you're at. I don't know where you are in your, in your mission I don't know where you are in your service or your servitude or if servitude even functions in your life. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you serve. <laughs> it just means you, you receive Jesus as the Savior. But it's one thing to have him as Savior. It's another thing to, to receive him and walk with him as Lord. See, Lord, it means master. 
So the thing is this, is today, I would hope that, that those of you who have been believers, you've already made the step and you've established yourself, I, I would hope that you then would take stock and as Paul said again, examine yourself to truly see if you are of the faith. Because being of the faith isn't just praying a prayer and going to church sometime. Being of the faith is selling out your life, laying it down and picking up his life and following him in obedience. So maybe this is a time of examination right now. Once again, don't justify it. Don't take a neutral scope of yourself and say, okay, I'm okay, I'm not a bad person. It's not about good or bad. It's about obedience or disobedience. I'm not saying you went out and killed anybody. But do you understand if you weren't obedient to the voice of God and a command or something that he told you to do, then can you really say you're of the faith? Really? Huh. Those of you who have never accepted Jesus into your life as Savior, you never asked him to come in, forgive you of your sins. You, didn't, you never have really taken that step where you said, all right, I'm going to lay my life down, my wants, my desires, my plans, my intents, I'm going to lay it down. And Lord, I'm going to pick I'm going to pick up the life of Jesus, the resurrected life. In other words, I'm going to die to this, and I'm going to come alive to this. Because it's only in this that you will ever find what I talked about earlier, joy and fulfillment. That's the only place. Oh, you might have little spurts and seasons of ups and downs and a good thing, or, you know, you got a present for Christmas. Woo, I'm happy. You know, maybe you got a little extra money somewhere. Woo, I'm happy. But you know what? Your life that way is only going to be based on happenings. And when it's just based on happenings, it's like a roller coaster. But a life of joy has nothing to do with what takes place out there. It has everything to do with what exists in here. It has everything to do with a power and, and, and a life that is resident in you, that you hold on to, that you hunker down, and that you get locked into, and you establish, and you allow the implanted word to be, to be seated right in the midst in your very heart so that what comes out of you can't be anything else but what's already in you. See, that's where we need to be. That's got to be our focus. That has got to be our passion. That's got to be our intent. Every single day, we can't come into a church and walk out of a church saying, whoo, okay, I checked that off the list today. Oh, no, you can actually come into a service like this and leave a service in worse shape than you came in because it's not dictated by this. It's dictated by your obedience to him.